Hi, person watching this video. Science is at a bit of a crossroads right now in mainstream culture. The two main paths are the anti-science and the pro-science camps, and personally, I'm pretty frustrated with both. The goal of this video is to try to strike a balance and carve out a middle path between the two positions, which recognizes the value of scientific inquiry, while also avoiding to put science on a pedestal of absolute truth that should never be questioned by a reasonable person. Let's start with the anti-science side of the debate. Contrary to popular belief, the anti-science movement is not very coordinated, and it can take on loads of different forms. These can include anti-vaccination, climate change denial, flat earthers, denying evolution by natural selection, and even something more reasonable, like criticizing the peer review process. So why has this happened? Why are people increasingly refusing to trust experts? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the rise of the internet. Because of the internet, people have access to virtually infinite information. You want to learn how to tie a tie, learn about plant morphology, or read up on the latest research in gene editing technology? You can do all of this and more, instantaneously, whenever you want. This has created a new structure, where knowledge is no longer restricted to university students and professors, but is usually freely accessible to anyone who has a computer and an internet connection. This has created a new movement of doing your own research, where people no longer rely on established scientific consensus to determine their views, but can now scour the internet for different evidence and perspectives. People will do some googling, read some articles, watch some talks on YouTube, and then believe that they know all the facts and can speak authoritatively on any given topic. The problem with this is that doing personal research, looking at random sources, and listening to commentators with an agenda is not equivalent to dedicating your life to a specialized field. In some ways, I think a major cause of this is the fact that scientific papers are almost always locked behind paywalls. It's much easier to find fringe, anti-science perspectives than it is to actually read the latest research on a given topic. I could rant for a while about how manipulative academic publishing companies are, and how they leech money off the work of others, and enclose the body of human knowledge behind crazy expensive paywalls, but I'll skip that for now. Another kind of cultural catalyst for this movement has to do with media. As everyone knows, news organizations are always trying to stir up controversy, since it gets more clicks. To accomplish this, they can take an issue that's usually considered uncontroversial, like evolution or climate change and frame it in a way that makes it seem controversial and unsettled. Fox News will have a NASA engineer on one side, and some guy with a website on the other side, and give them equal time to speak on their positions, and then turn to the audience and say, well, you decide who's right. Okay, so those are some reasons why anti-scientism might be on the rise. But why do people distrust science as an institution? I think this has to do with a pervasive myth about what science is which is present in both anti-science and scientism circles. People tend to think that science is about certainty and absolute truth. People point to the fact that scientific consensus has changed over time and say, aha, science is wrong sometimes, therefore we shouldn't trust it at all. An argument I've heard against vaccines is that doctors in the past used to use leeches to drain the blood of patients as a medical treatment. And this is clearly wrong, so why should we trust these vaccines that scientists are developing now? Science was wrong back then, so why can't it be wrong now? In reality, science isn't about certainty at all. Scientists are usually cognizant of the fact that their theories or results can always be disproved or rejected at a later time with more evidence. Some people see uncertainty as a weakness of science, but it's actually a strength. It means that scientists are always skeptical about their findings, and make sure to adjust their beliefs if contradictory evidence is presented. Science is an ongoing process of discovery, rather than a set of cold hard facts. Science is one of the most successful human enterprises. Over the past few centuries, we've discovered an immense body of knowledge and created amazing technological advances that have improved our lives and saved the lives of countless people. But science goes deeper than that too. It's a manifestation of human inquiry. Science is not just important for its practical applications, but also because a deeper understanding of the universe and the circumstances we find ourselves in is intrinsically valuable. Science didn't just come onto the scene out of nowhere. It grew and developed over a very long period of time. We developed different kinds of tools to help and refine our inquiry. We created physical tools like microscopes, 
intellectual tools like calculus and statistics, and social tools like the peer review system. Einstein wrote that science is nothing more than a refinement of everyday thinking. Another topic I want to touch on here a bit is how you might approach trying to convince people that hold on scientific beliefs. This is a really tricky thing to do, since people are often really psychologically attached to their beliefs. A bad approach would be to be aggressive and dismissive, making them feel stupid for holding those beliefs. All this accomplishes is strengthening their beliefs and forcing them to seek out more confirming evidence. A better strategy is to meet them at their level. You need to listen to what they have to say, treat them with respect, and try to gently point out where they're wrong. A good technique is to ask what evidence it would take for them to be convinced that they're wrong. I'm not saying this works 100% of the time, it usually doesn't work at all, but if you really want to convince someone, this is probably the way to go. Okay, so if anti-scientism is wrong, then let's just trust the science, believe science, and say that science is true. Unfortunately, this isn't the best approach either. Before I jump into scientism, we first need to understand what science is and how it works, and there's a few different perspectives on this. A pretty popular idea is that science is a fundamentally critical process. Scientists take nothing for granted and need hard evidence to support their beliefs. Scientists are always concerned with proving their own theories wrong, which is a system called falsificationism. In contrast, pseudoscientific ideas are seen as unfalsifiable, since there's no evidence you can provide which can prove them wrong. Pseudoscientists are always trying to protect and support their own theories, rather than trying to be critical of their own theories like scientists are. This perspective of science as a critical process characterized by falsificationism originated from the philosopher Karl Popper. Okay, so if that's what science is, then how does scientism emerge from that? Some people are so impressed with scientific achievements and discoveries that they will believe absolutely anything labeled scientific and will resist any criticism. The evangelical atheism of figures like Richard Dawkins has also caused some people to accept anything scientific as fact with the kind of religious fervor you would find with religious fundamentalists. Even as someone who's mostly atheist, it's worth pointing out that it's not obvious that science has proved religion to be false. There were plenty of atheists long before modern science was established, and religious people often take scientific ideas as evidence for their beliefs, like fine-tuning for instance. There's a kind of conflation between atheism and a scientific worldview, and I want to make it clear that I'm not against scientism because I have some kind of religious agenda to push. So to criticize scientism a little bit, I'll move on to a different perspective of what science is and how it works. Namely, the work of Thomas Kuhn, who was an American physicist, historian, and philosopher of science. Kuhn disagreed with Popper's idea that science is always critical. Instead, Science is only critical at specific and exceptional moments of human history. Kuhn puts forward a view of science that involves four distinct phases that continuously repeat themselves throughout human history. These phases depend on the context behind scientific inquiry, the set of theories, methods, concepts, and instruments that scientists take for granted. This context is what Kuhn calls a paradigm. You can already start to see the disagreement with Popper here, since Popper believed that scientists never take anything for granted. This paradigm of assumptions dictate and direct the research of the corresponding discipline. The first phase of science is the pre-paradigmatic phase. As the name suggests, this is the phase before a paradigm. There are no agreed upon theories, methods, or concepts. In early science, physicists didn't agree on the right way to describe and study the physical world. The early linguists, in the same way, didn't know what the best linguistic theories or methods were to understand language, and so on. This phase is very chaotic. Individual scientists are doing different things, using different instruments, holding different assumptions, and have different perspectives on which ideas are worth investigating. There's no shared vocabulary, which makes communication and collaboration very difficult. As you might expect, this phase of science isn't very effective, since everyone is constantly starting from scratch. Eventually, a single set of ideas and methods emerge as dominant, and then we move on to the next phase, normal science. In normal science, the paradigm has been established. There's a set of theories, concepts, ideas, methods, measuring instruments, and so on, which every expert takes for granted. For example, 
Modern biologists take for granted the idea that our bodies consist of cells, which contain DNA, that contain information that have an effect on our composition and behavior. They also accept that the microscope is an effective instrument for studying biological phenomena. In this phase, scientists tend to be very critical of new ideas and cutting-edge theories, and aren't very interested in criticizing the paradigm itself. Counterintuitively, Kuhn sees this as a good thing. Scientists can only get detailed work done because of the things we take for granted. If scientists had to constantly question all the basic facts of their discipline, they would never be able to make any progress. Sometimes, during normal science, scientists encounter anomalies. An anomaly is a problem within the paradigm that scientists currently can't solve. This might be an observation that contradicts some of the assumptions in the paradigm. Here, Popper would say that this is falsification, so we should just reject the whole paradigm and start from scratch. But Kuhn would say that this is fine, and that every scientific discipline always has anomalies. Sometimes, at certain moments in history, scientists lose confidence in their ability to account for these anomalies. If the amount of anomalies keeps growing, and we can't explain them, we reach the next phase. Crisis. Because of all those anomalies challenging the paradigm, scientists start doubting the paradigm itself. They start becoming interested in radical new theories, ideas, or methods, and they start thinking outside the box. Sometimes, this crisis doesn't really do much. The scientists end up solving the anomalies within the current paradigm, so their confidence is restored, and they just go back to business as usual. But in other cases, we have the next phase, scientific revolution. A new paradigm emerges, which can solve all those tricky anomalies of the previous paradigm. The scientists abandon the old paradigm and accept the new one, which Kuhn calls a paradigm shift. Some examples of this include the 17th century scientific revolution, the Darwinian revolution in biology, or the Chomskyan revolution in linguistics. When we reflect on the history of science, these are always the most notable moments. People often think about science as a series of revolutions, but they're actually the exception rather than the rule. The traditional view of science is that scientists learn more about the world as time goes on, identifying more true facts and theories, which build science up. There are sometimes issues or mistakes, but these are minor, and they could be fixed and addressed. Science is still understood as a linear progression. If you accept the theory of paradigms, this isn't quite right. Paradigms establish what constitutes good and bad science. Paradigm shifts don't just change specific ideas or theories, but they actually redefine what good or bad science even is in the first place. For example, Chomsky and Skinner have very different ideas about what good linguistics should be, and a pre-Darwinian biologist will similarly have different ideas about good biology compared to a post-Darwin biologist. Okay, let's take a step back. What does all of this have to do with scientism? Well, it means that science is not the infallible, perfect source of truth that Popper or the scientism people would say. Science is imperfect, and rests on loads of assumptions that are taken for granted. Science is a kind of theoretical fiction. It's a way of thinking and understanding the world that allows us to build knowledge and create new medicine and technology to improve our lives. It's not quite capital T truth, but it's the best we've got, and that's okay. Another aspect of scientism I want to touch on here is that it usually involves a dismissal of philosophy. Adherents of scientism are usually against things like conceptual analysis, a priori reasoning, and thought experiments. As an example, I'll point to the neuroscientist, popular science author, and podcaster Sam Harris, and his book The Moral Landscape. In this book, he basically argues that morality, what is considered right and wrong, can be solved entirely by science, and we can step away from all the antiquated philosophical theories about it. For Sam, facts and moral values are not distinct. As evidence for this, he points to research that has shown that the same brain regions are active when people contemplate facts and value judgments. Anyone well-versed in philosophy will immediately see that there's a problem here. Just because the same brain regions are active doesn't mean that these are distinct categories. Maybe the same brain regions are active when people engage in proper logical reasoning and when people make fallacious reasoning, like affirming the consequent. Even if the same brain regions are active, that doesn't imply that the categories aren't distinct. 
The fact that these brain regions are the same can't bridge the gap between is claims and ought claims. The moral theory that Sam proposes is that we ought to maximize well-being with all our actions and policies. This is a fine position, and Sam articulates what he means by well-being pretty thoroughly. But someone who's studied moral theory will instantly recognize this as a consequentialist ethics, in particular utilitarianism, which is always trying to maximize the best outcome and reduce the worst outcome. It turns out that consequentialism is highly controversial as a moral theory. There are also many intelligent people who argue for deontological ethics, or ethics based on a series of rules, or virtue ethics, which attach good actions to being a virtuous person. There's a very telling quote about Sam's methods here in the following footnote. I did not arrive at my position on the relationship between human values and the rest of human knowledge by reading the work of moral philosophers. I came to it by considering the logical implications of our making continued progress in the sciences of mind. It's unclear how consequentialist ethics is supposed to follow from considerations of progress made in the sciences of mind. There's no neuroscience that directly proves that well-being is paramount, and there's no neuroscience that proves consequentialism is the correct moral theory. Considering those logical implications of science basically just amounts to doing philosophy. This problem isn't entirely unique to Sam Harris, and it appears a lot in many popular science books. People who adhere to scientism are really quick to extrapolate from scientific results to grand conclusions about big questions. A problem with this approach is that science is always progressing very quickly, and old results are constantly being rejected. This means that those answers to big questions need to be retracted, and this gives the impression that science is a lot less consistent than it actually is, at least during normal science. And all of this undermines the authority of science. And philosophy isn't seen as the only enemy of scientism. Things like religion and the humanities in general, like literary theory or sociology, are also often dismissed by these people. Once again, this gives people the impression that science is automatically anti-religion or anti-humanities, which is not the case, and can be extremely alienating to people who are interested in these topics. We shouldn't always blindly accept science as fact and we shouldn't consider science as the only source of knowledge. But the attitude of always doing your own research is not the way to go. Modern society is built on the idea of everybody specializing in a hyper-specific discipline. We don't need to learn leatherworking to fix our watch band, because we could just pay an expert to do it for us. We don't need to learn how to build our own car to get around, because we can just buy one built by people who have spent their lives designing and constructing cars. We don't need to research tooth extraction to get our wisdom teeth out, we just pay an oral surgeon to do it. All of this saves us time and makes sure that we get the best possible result. The modern world is far too complex for one person to be an expert on everything, so we must in a sense trust the experts in whichever field we're not a part of. Rejecting this trust means rejecting everything modern society has provided to us. We should respect science, but we shouldn't worship it.